thank you for inviting me um, to present some of my work. Again, my name is Milky Kono, and I'm a postdoc in Dr. Edith London's Laboratory of Molecular Neural Imaging at UCLA. And I'll be presenting some work that examines risky decision making and related brain function and methamphetamine dependence. So stimulants such as methamphetamine are the second most commonly used drug worldwide. Along with it comes a number of consequences, medical issues to the user and related costs to society. Individuals can also face criminal prosecution and even premature death. Um, there's also environmental damage related to the toxic meth labs that are established. And meth use is also related to cognitive deficits. And studies have shown that meth dependent individuals exhibit impairments in um, Move the button to uh, over here. Make sure, can we make this? Okay, here we go. It's okay. Okay, so studies have shown that meth-dependent individuals exhibit impairments in abstract thinking, inhibitory control, impulsivity, and decision-making. So I focus on decision-making, and the impairments um, often exhibited in stimulant users with decision-making involve choices that uh, involve risk and reward. And one factor might be the way that uh, stimulant users evaluate reward. So when we think about the cycle of addiction, we often wonder why addicts don't just quit despite all of the negative consequences. But the benefits of using a drug are immediate. They have immediate relief of withdrawal symptoms, an immediate relief of negative affect, and of course the immediate rewarding properties of using the drug. And so even if the benefits of quitting are substantial, these benefits um, aren't realized for quite some time. And so the decision to quit can be especially difficult when getting high is just moments away. And this can be modeled in a laboratory task called the delayed discounting task. And in this task, participants are presented with choices. Would they like $10 now or $25 in one week? Would they prefer $50 now or $80 in one month? And laboratory studies have shown that meth-dependent individuals consistently choose the sooner smaller option over the larger later ones. And when examining the neural substrates related to these decisions, uh, studies have shown that meth-dependent individuals consistently show impairments in activation of different parts of the prefrontal cortex. Another task that evaluates reward processing is the monetary incentive delay task. And in this task, it assesses brain function when, participa uh, when participants are anticipating a reward. So in this example, this triangle serves as a cue that this trial could end in potential reward. And when examining differences between cocaine users and controls, uh, the study showed that cocaine users exhibit greater activation in the striatum and in the insula when anticipating a reward. So these results, along with the delayed discounting task, suggest that um, decision-making can reflect reward-seeking behavior among stimulant users. Another hallmark of addiction is the persistent use of drugs despite the risk of negative consequences. And risk taking has shown to be positively related to the length of drug use. And in laboratory tests of decision making, drug dependent individuals exhibit a greater propensity for risk taking compared to match controls. A meta analysis of studies that examined risky decision making among cocaine users and poly drug users found differences in neural activation compared to controls in the striatum, the orbital frontal cortex, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and the anterior cingulate. This picture on the right shows the uh, difference in the magnitude of activation of the prefrontal cortex between substance-dependent individuals and controls when performing the Iowa gambling task. 
So how are these frontal and striatal impairments related to decision making? In normal decision making, dopamine is released to signal a salient or relevant stimulus in the environment. And then this information is projected to regions involved in motivational states and executive processing, which together help guide adaptive decision making. Sorry. But stimulant use has been shown to cause abnormalities in striatal dopamine function. And human studies have shown that meth users exhibit deficits in D2, D3 receptor availability, tyrosine hydroxylase, and the dopamine transporter. Animal studies have also shown that stimulant administration leads to um, altered gene expression in the nucleus accumbens, an increase in digitic spines of the nucleus accumbens, and it's also shown to dysregulate proteins responsible for uh, dopamine receptor signaling. And so the involvement of dopamine in risky decision making comes from animal models that show that dopamine signaling influences risk preferences, risk taking behaviors, goal directed actions, and has also shown that D2 like receptor agonists have uh, shown to reduce risky choices in rodents. But stimulant use also causes uh, impairments in the prefrontal cortex and in cortical striatal signaling. And stimulant administration is related to an increase in the spine density of uh, prefrontal pyramidal neurons. Um, and this plasticity has shown to enhance prefrontal glutamatergic signaling. And this enhanced glutamatergic output contributes to amp-mediated potentiation of dopamine neurons and an increase in the firing rate of VTA neurons. And so uh, brain function during risky decision-making in meth users um, has not been evaluated. So our first question was whether uh, there are group differences between meth users and healthy controls in brain function during risky decision-making, specifically in uh, the DLPFC and in the striatum. To assess this, we used a balloon analog risk task, which was developed by Carl Lejue and was adapted for fMRI. In this task, participants are presented with the balloon, um, and they can pump the balloon for 25 cents. And with every successful inflation, they have the opportunity to earn an additional 25 cents. But they run the risk of the balloon exploding, resulting in a loss of accumulated earnings. Participants can also choose to cash out at any time in order to retain the earnings that they have accrued through the course of the trial. So we scanned 27 healthy controls and 24 meth-dependent individuals. Of all the variables listed, there is only group differences in the use of marijuana. And in our sample, the meth users used on average um, one and a half days um, more of marijuana in the 30 days prior to study admission. Therefore, marijuana use, age, sex, and smoking status were used as covariates of no interest. So I won't get into the details of the fMRI analysis, but standard pre-processing steps were applied. We also implemented a parametric design um, because each balloon pump is uh, presented with greater risk for greater reward we wanted to test the linear relationship between pump number and brain activation. Um, and so this parametric analysis corresponds to the increase in bold signal as a function of increasing levels of risk. I'll be presenting results from this analysis and we'll be referring to it as the modulation of activation. Each balloon pump was also modeled as non-parametric regressors just to control for the mean activation related with each choice. So when examining group differences in risky decision making, we first find that healthy controls exhibit greater modulation of activation in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex compared to the meth dependent individuals. However, meth users exhibit greater modulation of activation in the ventral striatum compared to controls. These results may suggest that uh, these risky decisions are reward driven behaviors in methamphetamine users and these impairments uh, may be explained by dysregulated cortical striatal connectivity. So the prefrontal cortex and the striatum are part of a bigger network, the mesocortical limbic system, otherwise known as the reward uh, pathway. So addictive drugs share the common property of enhancing midbrain dopamine function. Drugs of abuse target the VTA and either increase dopamine release or increase intrasynaptic levels of dopamine. With its diffuse projections to limbic regions, the prefrontal cortex and the striatum, this pathway is thought to be the final common pathway for the reinforcing effects of drugs. And so we wanted to first um, see whether neuroimaging can reveal the neural adaptations of the mesocortical limbic system that's been shown in animal models. And if so, what is the relationship between the activity of the mesocortical limbic system and brain function during risky decision making? 
To test this, we use resting state fMRI, which enables the, uh, the examination of intrinsic brain activity at rest. What we do is that we can examine um, how different brain regions are functionally connected and see how different um, activity of brain regions are correlated. And this measure is called resting state functional connectivity. It provides, um, because it provides information about the functional connectivity of brain regions in the absence of an explicit task, it helps delineate whether or not um, impairments in brain function are task specific or whether they exist in baseline activity. So uh, functional connectivity has not yet been evaluated in MEP-dependent individuals, so our first question was whether MEP-dependent individuals differ from controls in the resting state functional connectivity of the mesocortical limbic system. Um, to test this, resting state fMRI was acquired in a subset of participants who performed the BART. They were asked to stare at a black screen for five minutes while lying still in a um, fMRI scanner. Again, the nuisance covariates were age, sex, smoking status, and marijuana use. So we use what's called a seed-based approach for the analysis, where we create an ROI in the midbrain and in the DLPFC. So here's our midbrain seed, and what we do is we extract its activity throughout the time course of the scan. We then examine where um, activity in other brain regions are in sync or correlated with midbrain activity. When examining group differences, we find that the MEP users exhibit greater resting state functional connectivity um, between the midbrain, hippocampus, amygdala, putamen, and insula compared to match controls. And so just to recap, we show that there's group differences in brain function during risky decision making. We also show that there's group differences in the resting state functional connectivity of the mesocortical limbic system. So our next question is, what is the relationship between brain function during risky decision making and the intrinsic activity of this mesocortical limbic system? To test this, we extract what's called parameter estimates from the DLPSC, and this corresponds to the modulation of activation during risky decision making. We use these values as a regressor in a whole brain analysis using the midbrain and DLPSC as seed regions. And when examining the relationship between brain function during risky decision making and midbrain resting state, we find a negative relationship in the methamphetamine users, such that the meth users with greater activation in the DLPSC during decision making have less resting state connectivity between the midbrain, dorsal and ventral striatum, amygdala, insula, and medial orbital frontal cortex. Now when examining the um, analysis using the DLPFC as a seed region, we first find that there's no group differences in the resting state connectivity of the DLPFC. However, when we examine its relationship to brain function during decision making, we find an interaction by group. And this interaction was driven by the healthy control group who exhibits a positive relationship between activation of the DLPFC during decision making and resting state functional connectivity of the DLPFC the dorsal and ventral striatum, the hippocampus, and medial orbital frontal cortex. And so in summary, dysregulated cortical striatal connectivity may explain the differences in brain function in the DLPFC and in the ventral striatum between meth users and healthy controls. This is consistent with our results in the control group who showed a positive relationship between cortical striatal resting state connectivity and activation of the DLPFC during risky decision making. We also show that, grid, uh, that there was greater midbrain resting state in meth users, which may reflect stimulant-induced neural adaptations, which is consistent with animal models show that there are a stimulant-induced neural sensitization of this reward pathway. In the meth users, this greater midbrain resting state was related to less DLPFC activation uh, during risky decision making, which may suggest that the intrinsic hyperactivity um, in reward processing regions may diminish activation in regions important for executive processing. And so the results together highlight midbrain resting state as a viable therapeutic target, especially in behavioral cognitive therapies. And one idea would be using real-time fMRI or biofeedback to help these meth users downregulate the activity of their midbrain. With that, I would like to acknowledge our funding sources, thank all the members of the London Lab, and thank you all for listening. Great talk, Milky. We have time for a question or so. Alicia. Nice talk, Milky. Thank you. Um, stress does a very similar thing to cortical striatal limbic uh, pathways. So I'm wondering if you have any data on stress 
effects in these um, meth users? Um, we have self-reports of like state anxiety, um, childhood maltreatment, um, things like that, that we might be able to relate to this uh, resting state connectivity of the cortical striatal path. How did you measure uh, risky decision making? Um, we measured risky decision making use the, using the balloon analog risk task. And um, in the task, they pump the balloon to try and earn more money. But if they pump too much, the balloon can explode, resulting in a loss of money. So there was no other issue, it was just that? It was just that, okay. correct. Um, what, I know that you, you co-varied for marijuana use, but did you see anything come out at all in regard to any type of interaction with that? And also in relation to their history of use? And just going to, actually I had a question about the stress, but since you have, but in terms of um, the history of and the amount of meth use that may correlate to some of the uh, neuronal changes that you see? Um, so with the marijuana use, I actually never tested an interaction with marijuana use or any of those variables. I should go back and take a look for sure. Um, with regards to the years of methamphetamine use um, or even the days of meth use in the last 30 days, I didn't find a relationship with the midbrain resting uh, connectivity. Yeah, I would imagine that there should be, but it might be a small sample, and I would like to test it again with a larger sample. Thank you, Milky. Mm -hmm. Great talk.